Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. In 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4, now look at part 1. You will hear two students talking about university clubs and societies. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, are you the person to ask about joining a club? Yes, I am. What would you like to know? Well, I'm interested in several things, but I'd like to know more about the different clubs and how much they cost. I'm looking for a small club that's not too expensive. OK. Have a look at this table. You can see the names of the clubs, the fees, and the number of members. I'm afraid they aren't in any order. If you look at the top of the list, the first club is table tennis. That's one of our new clubs. Oh, right. So the table tennis club costs £20. That's quite expensive. Yes, it is a bit expensive. The cross-country cycling club is cheaper, though. Membership fees are only £15, but on the other hand, it's got a hundred members. The film and drama club costs a lot, doesn't it? Yes. Fifty pounds is a lot. And that's probably why it only has twelve members. Ah, uh, is there any other club you think looks interesting? Look at the next one. Street dance. Have you ever done any street dance? No, I haven't really. It's the cheapest. It only costs five pounds. Mm. OK. Shall we start with your interests? What do you like doing best? Um. well, I like photography. I've got a professional camera, so I take it quite seriously. But I can't really imagine belonging to a club to take photographs. I usually go on long walks on my own and take photos. So I like photography, but I wouldn't want to join a club to do it. OK. So what else do you like doing? Running? Oh, no, not running. I like walking, but I hate running. I'm afraid the running club isn't for me, or the cycling club. And film and drama? Ah, uh, no, it's far too expensive. But I do like yoga. I've practised yoga on and off for years. How many members does the yoga club have? It's always a small group. A lot of people sign up at the beginning of term, but they stop going after a few weeks so they're left with a few regular members every year. That sounds good. I think I'd like to join the yoga club. And what about the contemporary dance club? Is it expensive? Contemporary dance? No. It's not expensive. Ten pounds for the term. Do you like dance? Well, I've never tried contemporary dance, but I do like jazz and tap dance. How often does the group meet? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Listen and answer questions 8 to 10. So, can I have your full name, please? Victoria Mandeville. M-A-N-D-A-V-I-L? No, no. M-A-N-D-E-V-I-L-L-E. Double L-E. Thank you. And how old are you? 19. And your address? 57. Berry Gardens, 
Atherton Park, Manchester, M46. How do you spell berry? B E R R Y? No, it's B U R Y. Right, B U R Y. And do you have a contact number? Yes, my mobile is 07942 573 279. 07942 573 279. Yes, that's right. Is that all? Uh, one more thing. Do you have an email address? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech given to new employees at a museum. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 13. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Peter Myers, and on behalf of everybody here at Stevensbridge Dungeons, I would like to welcome you all to our entertainment team. This year, the hiring process was especially competitive, and it might interest you all to know that for every position, there were almost 30 applicants, so you really are the best of the best. In a moment, I will take you on a tour of the museum so you can get an idea of what the space is like. But first of all, I would like to show you around the staff room. Our staff room is located at the back of the building over here. You will notice that there are two entrances to the staff room. One leads to the room we're in now, which is the main and oldest dungeon here at Stevensbridge, which we have turned into the museum. This is where you will greet the new visitors and also where the tour throughout the dungeons will begin. I should mention now that we only ever send visitors through as part of a group. So even on the busy days, you will still get roughly 10 minutes of free time between each group. Make sure you use that time wisely, because you'll need to get straight back into character as soon as it's over. Now look at questions 14 to 20. Right, follow me and I'll show you the layout of the museum. From the museum, we can pass through this door near the interactive display into the staff room. From here, you can see the steps at the far side in the opposite corner that lead outside into Berwick Street. When you arrive for a shift, it will be much easier for you all to come in the Berwick Street entrance directly down the steps to the staff room. If you come in through the main visitor entrance, it will take you longer to get past security. As you can all see, there are lockers on your right-hand side. Uh, they should be big enough for you to put your bags and coats in. You'll get given keys later that work with any of the lockers in here. Over on the other side, past the lockers, is our most exciting area. This is where our wardrobe and makeup will take place. Every shift, you will be transformed from normal people into grotesque medieval prisoners. If you're lucky, you get to be the jailer. 
but even they rarely bathed in those days. Of course, some of you might consider yourselves method actors, but please do try to shower before your shift. We don't want to give visitors an experience that's too authentic. Now, we do have a staff shower here if you really need it. It is located next to the staff toilets, which are unisex. I hope nobody has too much of a problem with that. Unfortunately, dungeons were not really designed with comfort in mind. You can find the bathroom at the other end of the room from the makeup area. There is also another toilet for the public, concealed just to the right of the door into this room. Let's move back into the museum. We have three main sections down here. The first one you pass into when you leave the staff room is the museum. This is where all the useful information can be found such as dates, number of prisoners and the kinds of torture that we used. I know it's a lot of information to take in on your first day, but try to learn as much of it as you can. Even though you'll mostly be in character, visitors might want to ask you some questions and it would be great if you could tell them more about the dungeons. I think it would be more interesting if visitors could learn directly from you rather than having to read about it. As you can see, on the left we have an interactive display for children and on the right we have a photo booth. This was the original dungeon, first built in 1435. Now, let's pass through into the main dungeon that was added during the Tudor period in around 1570. You might be able to feel that the air is a lot damper and cooler here. That is because we are now beneath the River Stevens. This is primarily the room in which most of you will be working. This is where many high-profile religious figures were held, sometimes for years on end. Depending on the roles you will be playing, you can either be chained up, free to roam, or, if you're a jailer, wandering between prisoners to keep an eye on them. Now we will pass into our third and final section, the prison cells. Over here, you can see there are some wooden stocks and a fake gibbet. <laughs> don't worry, I can see a couple of you looking concerned. You don't need to reenact any of the torture scenes for visitors. One person each shift will play the jailer in here, where you will give a speech to the group about some of the more notable prisoners to stay here in the past. This is usually the end of the tour but some visitors will certainly want to ask you more questions at this point, so please try your best to make yourselves available. Help them by answering any questions they have. Also, feel free to guide the visitors through the museum if you see that they're going the wrong way. This concludes our introduction to your new workplace. If you'll please follow me, I will get you all issued with your keys and some information about the dungeons that you can take home with you to study. I will also introduce you to your shift supervisor, Alice Stiles, and you can ask her any questions you may have about your roles. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two people who are about to share a project at work. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Bill. How are you? I'm okay now, Sarah. 
but I was so ill last week. Oh dear, what was the problem? Did you eat that dodgy fish in the canteen? No. At first, I thought it was a cold, but then my head started hurting and my eyes started to go blurry. Oh, I'm so sorry. That sounds serious. Yeah, it's okay actually. I went to the doctor and he diagnosed me with a migraine. He gave me some medicine and I'm starting to feel much better. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Well, I'm also glad you're in today because we have to work on a new project together. Oh, are we in the same section? No, it's just us. No one else. Mr. Donaldson put us down as B team because we live near each other. That could be fun. What do we have to do? Well, the project is partly internet research, then checking reference books for information to prepare a survey, which we have to use with people we know. Great. What's the topic? It's to do with shopping over the last 10 years. We have to find out how customers have changed their behavior. Okay. So, what's the first step? I think the first thing to do is to check the list of references he gave me. But my computer is in for repair, so if I check in the reference library, would you be willing to look up some references online? Once we're done with the reference checks, we can write the questions together. That's fine. I'll do the internet research. So, what sort of shopping are we looking at? Only food or goods or clothes shopping? We have to find people who are willing to tell us about personal things, like deodorants, cosmetics, soap or vitamin creams. The other groups are doing food, electrical goods and clothes. That won't be so easy, Sarah. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People might think those things are a bit private. Yes, I thought about that. I'll ask the women and you can ask the men. That should work okay. Well, if you think so. Give me the list of references then. Sorry, I left them in my other bag at Joseph's house. I'll get them for you tomorrow. Okay. Well then, this afternoon, I think I'll catch up on the notes from last week. Can you help me or are you busy? I've made you a copy of my notes already to save you time. Here you are. Wow, thanks Sarah. That's so thoughtful. Well, since there's nothing for us to do right now, shall we go for lunch? Well, actually, I'll have to catch you later. I have to go to a meeting this afternoon. Can I phone you tonight to arrange when to meet? No, sorry. I have a date. Can we meet in the laboratory for the first class tomorrow? I'm not sure, because I have to go to the library to collect some books. What about meeting there at lunchtime? Do you mean in the lab? Yes. OK. See you in the laboratory tomorrow at noon, then. Sounds like we have a lot of work to do. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture about geotourism. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now, I'd like to move on to talk about something called geotourism. Geotourism is very basically leveraging the benefits of tourism for local communities. I would just like to give you a couple of statistics which are very illustrative of the current situation with regard to young travellers and international tourism. Firstly, tourism has an impact on more people worldwide than any other industry. Indeed, it has an impact on one in every two people, either directly or indirectly. The second statistic is that in global tourism, there is a 97% economic leakage. This means that if you spend £100 on going on holiday, normally only £3 of that money will actually reach the people who are giving you the services and the accommodation, for example, in the destination. If you put these two figures together, you can understand why some of the regions of the world which have very high levels of tourism still have very high levels of poverty and huge developmental challenges. These countries have this massive industry demanding a huge number of services, but they are not seeing a fair reward for these services. Geotourism is about changing this. Projects are now being developed with financial organisations such as the World Bank. One of these involves developing a technology platform which is bringing grassroots travel products such as hotels, locally owned hotels, not global chains, very locally owned tour operators to the international travel market, therefore avoiding the middlemen. These middlemen often cut them out of the market completely or just make their business unsustainable. Another way that geotourism can be promoted is through the niche travel market of volunteering. These days, a significant number of older teenagers want to spend a gap year, either between school and university, or university and employment. Often, these people want to spend some or all of their year volunteering, but they either don't have the money or don't feel inclined to pay the main volunteering organisation businesses the fee they require, which can be as high as £3,500. What they are looking for is an organisation who can connect them with people on the ground, who can suggest worthwhile local projects. So, this is a real win-win scenario. The organisers charge a small flat fee, which then goes to the local contact. Thus, the local contact gets a very good commission just for one customer. The customer is also saving a large amount of money and time, both of which they can give to the projects they end up working on. There is still quite a long way to go before poverty in the most popular of tourist areas is eradicated, but a focus on this type of geotourism could provide an answer. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.